And as you folks come and join us, if you'd be so kind as to tell us uh, your name and let us know where you're joining us from. And um, if you'd be so kind, tell us also if you have active mosquitoes in your area uh, yet or not. I write a blog today, which I will be sharing with everyone. And <coughs> it has, uh, sorry, we also have a, have a lot of new pollen out here, which is uh, which I have allergies to. Um, so good sharing the, the blog with everyone so that you'll have access to the different videos and things that we're sharing today. All right, Elizabeth City. So, all right, you're like us over here in uh, Damascus, Maryland. We have started to see um, active mosquitoes. I actually, I, I had one mosquito trap that I'd made out of a two liter soda bottle and I made three more yesterday. I baited them with rice water and I've written on the outside, you know, what they're baited with. I know I'm a nerd, but I just find this is absolutely fascinating. And I put one out on my back porch and then the other three have been put around and out in the yard with some rocks in the bottom to hold them down. So if you don't know what a mosquito trap is, you basically are taking a two liter soda bottle and you're taking a little net and putting it down at the, at the bottom of it. I should have brought one up with me. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go grab, I'm gonna stop for a second here. I'm gonna run downstairs and grab one of my mosquito traps and bring it up. So carry on among yourself uh, and um, go ahead and write where you're coming in from. And I will show you, uh, Luna, just one second. All righty, mosquito trap. Whoop. I'm muted by the host. Okay, so I grabbed my mosquito trap. It's basically a two liter soda bottle. And I, whoops, cut it off at the top, you know, cut this part off. Then I took some, some tool. And this was some that I got from this little craft store that sells it for people like, I guess if you're going to weddings and you're making some like little wedding favors. So I took the tool and Rusty Lowe, our scientist taught me how to make this. I take a little bit of tool and I just use a rubber band and put it on the end of my bottle here. Then I, as you can maybe see here, I wrote rice water because that's what I baited it with. I just took rice and soaked it in a water. This is the rice we had for dinner the other night, some nice jasmine rice. And uh, so what, what I want to happen, and also I took an emery board and I scuffed up the, uh, the inside of my, take this off here, of my funnel here. Come here, funnel. It's getting stuck there. So I took the inside of my funnel part, I scuffed that up with my emery board. And what I want to happen is I want to attract the female mosquito who has her eggs to come over and lay her eggs down here in the funnel section. And then when it rains a little bit, the eggs will be, will go down um, into the uh, mosquito trap here. And then just in case they happen to go through their uh, life cycle and hatch, uh, they can't get out. Um, so that's what that netting uh, serves to do at the bottom. And so I'm kind of trying uh, with a couple of different baits to see if I, if I put a few of these traps in the same location, trying to see if I can uh, attract, you know, more mosquitoes in one and fewer mosquitoes in the other. So again, just two liter bottle, thank you. And then rice water, it looks backwards to you guys. My little netting here, my little rubber band. I scuffed it up a little bit with my emery board and there you have it. I'm ready and waiting for mosquito larva. So how cool is that? All right, so thank you very much, everybody, for being here. It is now 8 o'clock, so we will officially begin. We can start. I see we started our recording. Fantastic. And it is just my pleasure and my honor to be meeting with everybody tonight. Thank you for uh, putting up with a change in time. We wanted to ensure that one of the countries that does an awful lot of research using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper is Thailand. And 
if we do it at two o'clock in the afternoon, that is one o'clock in the morning for Thailand and it's not very conducive for them to join us. So there's still, it's, it's not the best of times. Right now it's 7 a.m. in the morning, but we have some of our friends from Thailand who are gonna be joining us today, as well as from many, many other places as well. And please feel free to be writing things in the chat box. My, uh, my, my left hand, and I am left-handed, so uh, the, the person who holds things up for us here, well, of course, is Cassie and Rusty. And Rusty will be taking a look and, and writing responses. So she is our scientist who works with this project, extremely knowledgeable about all things mosquito and other things as well. So feel free to be asking her questions. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be focusing on the many ways in which the Mosquito Habitat Mapper was used in conjunction with several other protocols to conduct student research projects. I hope as you're watching this, you're gonna be inspired and say, wow, I would really love to do a project. Uh, some good news is that you don't have to wait for the International Virtual Science Symposium. You can enter that one as well, but you can also uh, be submitting a student research project anytime. And students go all the way up to the graduate level. And I know that we're even, uh, you know, interested in having citizen scientists who may be older, mature folks like myself engaging in doing uh, research and investigation. So please, all of you feel welcome to, to be involved in this. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these investigations and some of the updates on the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. Then we're going to be hearing from Inez from Brazil, then Pachara from Thailand, and Jeff from the United States. I have taped in advance their students giving some presentations and answering some questions. So we'll be working on bringing those in and out and, and showing those to you. All of these will be made available to you to look at later in case we don't finish seeing them in their entirety or if you want to use them to inspire other people whom you are working with. I'll also be, of course, talking about the Mosquito Habitat Mapper Honor Roll for the last 30 days and then upcoming events. So next uh, slide, please. I'd like to start off by just reminding everybody that the Globe Mission Mosquito Campaign is a campaign that's connecting citizen scientists of all ages. We're working on monitoring changes in the frequency, the range, and the distribution of potential disease vector mosquitoes. And we are conducting research to see how these vary in response to ex uh, environmental conditions. Next slide. Oh, and this is a fusion of the GLOBE and the GLOBE Observer campaigns or programs. So with the Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool, there are four steps. You do not have to do them all. The first step is to identify potential breeding, mosquito breeding habitats. That is something that you can do all year long, even when you don't have, or for those of us who don't have active mosquitoes all year long, you should still be doing this all year, year long. Going around like once a week, checking for any places where you see standing water and taking a picture and then saying whether or not you see uh, evidence of, of active mosquitoes. Second step is let's say you do see some mosquito larva, maybe some pupa, perhaps some eggs, maybe even adult mosquitoes, you sample and count. The next step is photographing and identifying the species of larva. For that, you do need to have an inexpensive cell phone magnifier that you put on the, on the camera of your cell phone, or you could have a microscope, but you're taking pictures of the larva. We walk you through a dichotomous uh, key to help you try to identify the species of larva that you have found. At the larval stage, they cannot hurt you. And uh, they're also absolutely fascinating when you take them and you magnify them and you work on trying to identify which kind of mosquito species you have. And the fourth step is eliminating the breeding site, which is a wonderful habit for everybody to be getting into. So we hope that all year long, even if you don't uh, have active mosquito season all year long, you're at least doing step one and potentially step four um, because that's a huge help and, and probably the most important thing we can all do to reduce the threat of mosquito transmitted disease. Next slide. 
Couple of tips, um, as I was saying, please make sure you're taking data even when it's an active mosquito season. These are some pictures I took a few weeks ago just walking around my house. I found, uh, and, and the first picture is like this little ornamental statue I have, there was water in there. So I make sure that once a week I check that water and I empty it. This was my uh, granddaughter's sandbox. It had been sitting up against the side of the house, had a lot of water. This happened to be over here, the, the Christmas tree uh, uh, stand. And then way on the right here, that's actually one of my mosquito traps. So make sure you're collecting your data all year long. Next slide, please. And want to remind everybody that there is an extra step. You can be collecting data even if you don't have internet connectivity, but you want to also be sure that when you do have internet connectivity, you are sending your data in. Also, um, for those of you who might want to just be kind of practicing with this, or you might have uh, incorrectly entered something, you have the option of deleting it before you send it, so don't be scared to use this. Next slide, please. Um, as of the 3rd of June, so two days ago, we had 12,473 observations that had been made. Um, last uh, month it was 11,000, it was about 695 less. So we're moving up, moving up, moving up. Of course, the more observations we have, the better, the more useful our data is. And in this map, you can see where all of those observations have been made from. And we can see some of our gap areas as well. So thank you to all of you who've been submitting data. Next slide, please. Uh, today, gonna be talking about using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, also known as the MHM, for student research. Once a year, there is the International Virtual Science Symposium, and that is uh, uh, run by the GLOBE program. The teachers and students submit their projects online, and this year we are just thrilled because 23 of the International Virtual Science Symposium projects use the Mosquito Habitat Mapper in their research. I'll be showing you the titles of these and then also reading you a little bit of information about the Mosquito Protocol Bundle to give you some ideas of ways in which you might be working with your community to do some of this research. And 15 different countries um, had sent these projects in. So uh, next slide, please, thank you. I'm gonna read you a little bit from the Mosquito uh, Protocol Bundle, which is um, just right up there on the GLOBE website, and then letting you see the titles and the country that the different projects have come from. Pathogens spread by mosquitoes kill more than a million people each year across the world, mostly in tropical regions. Increasing temperature and rainfall are potentially providing suitable conditions and habitats for mosquitoes to spread pathogens, however, and climate alone is not enough. Next slide, please. The mosquito has already hitchhiked to Europe and North America with eggs attached to used tires and lucky bamboo. Movement of people, not shifts in climate, is the biggest risk. That is why doing the Mosquito Habitat Mapper app along with globe hydrology and atmosphere protocols is important for raising awareness, pathogen management and control in your area. And as you can see by the titles of these projects, they're looking at a lot of different aspects of mosquitoes and the environmental conditions. And next slide, please. You can make a difference in tracking and controlling the spread of mosquitoes and help save your loved ones from getting mosquito transmitted disease. In the last 50 years, there has been a 30-fold increase in mosquito-borne diseases, as well as geographical expansion of the incidence to new areas and countries, particularly in rapidly expanding urban and semi-urban places in middle and low-income countries where water storage and waste disposal services are limited. Next slide, please. And I'm just gonna finish this up. An estimated 50 million dengue infections occur annually, and about 2.5 billion people live in regions with the potential risk of dengue transmission. And you will see that some of the research that's been done in Thailand is focusing specifically on the dengue virus. Next slide, please. I have an interactive map, which Cassie's gonna demonstrate for you, and uh, I will be putting the link in there that you can also see there as well so that you can access it 
in case you'd like to look at the, these different research projects. And what you can do is you can see um, where you would find these, uh, these different uh, countries. Then when you click on the, on the dot that's on the country, you can see the name of the school. And you can also see the title of the, uh, of the research project. It does say link on there, and the link actually doesn't work because the links were too long. So uh, don't try the links for that. But I am going to be showing you how you can get to the different projects if you want to see them. Thank you so much, Cassie. So when you go to that link, this is the interactive map that you will see. And um, you can see the different countries that are represented. We had, like I say, 23 projects from 15 different countries this year. And I hope that we're going to see a whole lot more red dots on this map next year. And please know that, that myself and the rest of the Globe Mission Mosquito team are ready and waiting to help you, your students, or your citizen science groups conduct research using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. Thanks, Cassie. Next slide, please. So if you want to see the different international virtual science symposium projects to get a feel for what was submitted this year and get some ideas of things that you could do. What you do is you go to the GLOBE website. Then what I found the fastest is there's a little search, just a little magnifying glass, just click on that and put in there IVSS student reports. Then you're going to see one of the options is 2019 virtual science symposium. Go ahead and click on that. Then on the left-hand side of that, you're going to see Virtual Science Symposium Reports. Then once you get in there, you're going to see a filter by icon. Put it on 2019 Virtual Science Symposium. Um, you'll see, though, that there also is a choice for just science re student research projects, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but go ahead and put in 2019 uh, Virtual Science Symposium filter by hydrosphere and then put in mosquitoes and then what you're going to get you have an option of do you want elementary school middle school high school college you know all or none and you'll be able to pick and choose which of those you want to filter it by and you can see all of the reports some of the reports have videos most of the reports have a poster presentation and all of them have a written report in english as well so really, really nice work. Next slide, please. And you can add a student research report any time. You don't have to wait until the International Virtual Science Symposium. All of the directions and that picture, I know you can't see very well, but I just put it up to give you an idea of what it looks like. All of the directions are up there on the website. Basically, just go to the GLOBE page and this time put in your search for student research reports. Then when you are uploading your research report, as long as you've used the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, and we hope you will, you know, perhaps you'll even uh, be like me and just take some of these uh, uh, two liter bottles and put on there, you know, the name of the different uh, um, type of bait you use, maybe fish food, maybe alfalfa pellets, maybe just a little bit of biomatter, grass and leaves, maybe rice water, you know, put them out and look and see where do you attract more mosquito larvae, more mosquitoes. So, uh, you know, all kinds of neat things that you can be doing and you'll be learning more during this webinar. And go ahead and do some research and you don't have to wait till the International Virtual Science Symposium. But it'd be great if you also click Mission Mosquito Report so that way it'll be easier to filter. And next year when we're doing this and, and bragging on the people who have been submitting reports, you'll be right up here uh, being bragged about as well. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about the bundling of the mosquito data. What I was reading to you earlier, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's basically just called the Mosquito Protocol Bundle. And if you go to uh, the search option in GLOBE, put in there Mosquito Protocol Bundle, it's going to give you a lot of nice scientific background on why you were uh, able to use these different protocols to be able to better understand mosquitoes. And you don't, of course, have to use all of these protocols. When you hear from the students that are presenting their, their data today, you'll hear that a few of them are looking at air temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, and the mosquito habitat mapper. 
Some of them were also looking at water quality or were just looking at water quality, weren't measuring of air temperature precipitation. You get to pick and choose. It's a cafeteria a la carte menu. Make sure you're using the mosquito habitat mapper and then you might also want to be using land cover or you know soil moisture, some other environmental factors to be able to uh, use to be looking for a cause and effect, a potential cause and effect relationship. The mosquito bundling provides a group of GLOBE protocols through which knowledge can be integrated to enable students, scientists, and citizen scientists to gain a better understanding regarding where we're gonna be seeing these mosquitoes and mosquito transmitted diseases. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna be hearing, this is the most important part of this, uh, of this presentation tonight. We're gonna to be hearing from some of these teachers. Um, you're gonna be seeing some, of, some, some taped uh, presentations from their students. For our students from Brazil, their native language is of course Portuguese, and from Thailand, their native language is Thai. I am not proficient or even barely proficient in any of those languages, and so I am just awed at the fact that the students were able to write their report and present for us tonight uh, in English to make it easier for all of us uh, who don't speak those wonderful languages to be able to get a feel for what they did. So now we're gonna hear from Inez Mao students in Brazil. In uh, this first video, they're going to be respond, um, are telling us a little bit about um, what they learned as a result of doing their mosquito investigation. And they will also be um, giving us a feel for what some of their best practices are. The investigation that they did is called Facility or Freedom. That is the question. And what they're looking at with their research is they're trying to figure out whether placing the artificial captive breeding traps, the kinds that I was showing you, with smelly fish food uh, works better to attract the adult female mosquito if they're trying to come there um, and, uh, and, and you know, lay their eggs. You can see their entire presentation of their project. I'm gonna put that in here. We're not gonna be watching that whole thing tonight. What we are gonna be seeing tonight is their response to some questions that I asked about uh, what they learned from their research and some of the best practices they would suggest to others. All right, so we'll watch the video. What did you learn about mosquitoes for doing this IVSS project? We learned that mosquitoes are adapted to live in cities and they are opportunistic because they prefer to be free near the people. How do you think doing this investigation will change your behaviors to help reduce the threat of mosquito transmit disease in the future? I will help the school community to prevent and mitigate breeding sites as well as educate parents and other students on the collection and identification of mosquitoes to reduce their disease. Sarah, any advice you would offer to other students who want to do mosquito-related research projects? Mosquito-borne disease prevention project is a little ant work. We have to make people aware that the need of destroying breeding sites is the only solution to a real prevention for everybody. Um, Inez, do we have you on to tell us a little bit about the research and perhaps answer any questions? And so Inez, if you want to give us just a little bit of information, as Rusty says, you are the mosquito queen in Rio. Uh, you can feel free to jump on. Okay, so if you have any questions, then Inez will be happy to answer them. Inez, I was wondering, how often did your students get a chance to go out and collect their mosquito habitat mapper data? Uh, we collect data every two days because I have uh, traps, eight traps in the school. So it's easy to collect traps because it's near where I sit, where I stay, because I'm uh, I'm science teacher and I'm a librarian teacher too. So I, I can, we can go outside every day if we need, because we have larvae every day. We collect, we, we identify, then we, we see which larvae is, is, is Culex or Aedes 
uh, we let them grow a little to see the poop, uh, then to, to, to be sure that it's a uh, uh, reptile or coolant. And then we throw them away. Some some kids like, ah, oh, don't don't kill them, don't do that. I'm going to put a name in the larvae. No, don't no, let's throw them away. <laughs> that 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 is that is a very I, I understand how you know that response. You know, on the other hand, the good news is we have so many mosquitoes in this world, or the bad news. And they do cause so many diseases, which was another question I, I had for you. What types of mosquito transmitted diseases are found in the Rio de Janeiro area and maybe in Brazil uh, as well? No, in Brazil, we have the three, uh, we, we have the, at the uh, Anopheles, uh, Aedes aegypti, and Culex, and uh, Aedes albopictus. But near my school, we, we only have Culex and Aedes aegypti. Well, I'm glad you're not finding Anopheles near your school, as I know no, those are the malaria. Uh, uh, only in Amazonia, yes. And, and I guess one la a spoiler alert here, but one more question. What did your students find was the most effective type of bait for attracting female mosquitoes to come lay their eggs? It's uh, fish food, it's the best. If you put today, two, uh, in two days we have you have larvae. I'm making myself a note. But I'm gonna write fish food because my son has a fish and I will ask him to bring me some fish food so I can t test that as well. <laughs> Yes, and you, when you put the, the trap, you don't need to use rubber. You can use the ring from the, the, can, the bottle to put the tulip. Excellent, it's excellent, excellent. Very good to know. Well, thank you very much, Anaz. If anyone, oh, um, I see. So uh, Rusty wanted to know what kinds of mosquitoes did you find this year? And you may have just answered, I believe that you just answered that with, uh, oh, there we go, here's another, you, you just answered that one actually. Rusty anticipated what I was gonna ask you. What type of fish yeah. food? Goldfish, other species, pellets, flakes? No, the flakes one. Okay. The flakes. And, and you know what, mess around with this. You know, this is, what, what a great science investigation this is you know, testing to see what types of baits are, you know, adult mosquitoes, female mosquitoes attracted to. Yes, so, uh, because when, when you use rice, sometimes there is a worm in the rice. And, and this worm does uh, not uh, let the larvae grow. But when you use fish food, it's, it's uh, better to, do the, to use at the traps. Try them, you are going to like. <laughs> very, very good. Well, uh, I, I do know that, you know, it, it really is one of these kinds of things that's very addicting. Um, and, you know, doing this scientific, scientific experiment and doing them also just a, around your household. For myself, I may not be, you know, uh, entering a student research report, at least, you know, not by myself, even though I will admit I'm a student of life. But nonetheless, I really, really like just, you know, trying to figure this out and have these different, different, you know, uh, mosquito traps around and to see what I can find. So, again, thank you so much, Inez, and thank you to your students. When you send me their names, um, I will make some certificates and send them on to the students who participated in that, as well as yourself, to thank you for uh, working so hard to help us to better understand one of the ways that a student science investigation was done using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. We really appreciate it. Now I want to take you around the world from Brazil uh, to Thailand. Uh, in uh, Trang, Thailand, we're uh, going to be hearing today from Pachara Pangmanuat students, and they're going to be telling us about the research that they did. I met with them online and I taped them the other day, and they just did a fantastic job of presenting their research. So we're gonna go ahead and watch that, and I will also share with everybody 
the link to that. So again, you can share that with your students or with other, other people and be able to, to see that later as well. All right, Cassie, if you'll go ahead and show us that video. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pimpina Pongsirikun. My name is Sarisa Songkram. My name is Chanuk Nan Oma. We are from Princess Jola Ponsai High School, Drang, Thailand. Today, we are going to present the research is Study of Mosquito Species and Their Number in a Touristic Place in Phang Meng Beach, Drang. There are many mosquito-borne diseases in the world, such as dengue, chikungunya, malaria, filariasis, and syphilitis and they're from a different mosquito species. Do you know how about mosquito borne disease in a touristic place? Among the traveler, around 2 to 10% have chance to get mosquito borne disease in another country, so we need to do a research on mosquito in a touristic place. Every year, around 32.6 million foreigners come to Thailand, and many of them come to Phang Minh Beach. From this slide, you can see the total number of Thai people and foreigners who come in Drang in 2018. The total number of tourists, travelers, and visitors are 3 million. Our objectives are to study the diversity of mosquito larvae in hotel and resort in a touristic place and to study their habitats and water qualities of their habitats. Our hypotheses are Mosquito larvae numbers should be more in hotel and resort than restaurant because of present of dish beside hotel and resort. And culex species should be more in number in hotel and resort compared to other mosquito larvae that they prefer dirty water like dish water. This is our study area. Yellow color show as hotels and resort. Pink color show as restaurant. Equipment for our collection mosquito larvae. There are aquarium net, bucket, data sheet, permanent pen, rubber band, and plastic bag. Equipment for measuring water quality. There are PC test 35, pH meter, conductivity meter, and infrared thermometer. Equipment for preserving and, and identifying mosquito larvae. There are small plastic bowl, alcohol 70%, distilled water, dropper, faucet, and microscope. Experimental design. For first step, we went to Park Main Beach to collect mosquito and then check water quality of water habitat. Next, collect mosquito larvae and preserve mosquito larvae for identify and analysis data. This slide shows water habitat in 10 restaurants. We found five large earthen jars, one small earthen jar, and one plastic tank. This slide shows water habitat in 17 hotels and resorts. We found 31 plastic tanks, 16 cement ponds, 14 water gardens, 9 small earthen jars, one plant plate, and one ditch. This picture shows the number of total mosquito larvae in our study size. Yellow color show as hotel and resort. Pink color show as restaurant. We found the most mosquito larvae in hotel and resort. There are 1,250 mosquito larvae. This slide shows the numbers of mosquito larvae in our study site between restaurant and hotel resort. Unix species was higher in hotel and resort than restaurant. It is Avopictus was higher in a restaurant than in hotel and resort. In both places, Punic species was higher than other species. This slide shows the numbers of mosquito larvae in a different habitat. This is the total habitat numbers. There are 79, and this is the numbers of positive habitat. There are 23. We found four types of mosquito larvae. There are 88 types. It is Avopictus, Pulex, and Topsorinchitis. We found it is 80 times, only in plastic tanks in restaurants. Higher number of it is Avopictus was found in the same place. Higher number of Pulex was found from ditch. And we found Topsorinchitis, only in small earthen jars in hotel and resorts. This slide shows the figure one. 
between pH and mosquito larvae. You can see that it is a diptide, it is albopictus, and toxorinchitis prefer higher pH compared to Pulex species. This slide shows the figure two between water temperature and mosquito larvae. You can see that toxorinchitis and Pulex species prefer higher water temperature compared to Aedes aegypti. The figure three between conductivity and mosquito larvae. You can see that conductivity was not different among habitats of different mosquito larvae because p-value is more than 0 0.05. And the figure four between surface water temperature and mosquito larvae. You can see that surface water temperature was not different among habitats of different mosquito larvae because p-value is more than 0 0.05. This is our conclusion. Here we see that 1,491 mosquito larvae was found in hotel and resorts. Around 99% of them was Pulex, 0.3% of them was Toxorinchitis, and 0.2% of them was Aedes albopictus. 233 mosquito larvae was found in restaurants. Around 60% of them was Pulex, 30% of them was Aedes aegypti, and 10% of them was Aedes albopictus. Suggestion based on our study to suggest the administration to control the mosquito, to inform the mosquito situation to the tourists, to make them aware about mosquito situation, and to make the park main beach a safe place for the tourists. In the future, we will, we will go to park main beach again to collect mosquito in rainy season and get information to compare with information in summer season because we come to collect mosquito in summer. Many tourists come to Park Main Beach, but water in habitat has not much, so we cannot find many of mosquito. We would like to thank our teacher from Malay Lak University, Rajmankala University of Technology, Sivajaya Trang Campus, Nakonsi Tamarat Rajpat University, and Princess Jua Bonsai High School Trang. Thank you oh for your God. attention. Wow, thank great. you. Thank you. Oh, we can go ahead and stop that there, Cassie. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. In a minute, we'll see if anyone has any questions for uh, Pachara and her students. I, I wanted to, um, to say that the other day I had gone to my chiropractor, and outside the chiropractor's office, they have a barbecue grill. And in the barbecue grill, it had uh, lots of rainwater had fallen down, and it had uh, you know a whole lot of water sitting there. So in the same way that Pachara students had gone and taken pictures and 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 you know shown the different uh, tourist locations that hey you guys have these potential mosquito breeding, breeding habitats. When I went in to uh, work with my chiropractor, I pointed out that I had seen you know this this water sitting in this. Uh, in, in their barbecue grill and they came out and I showed them how, how the app worked they were very interested it's also a physical therapy place and they were so interested to see uh, how you could use the mosquito habitat mapper and I showed them you know pictures and showed them you know the, the water that was in there and they you know realized that it's super important to be checking their water you know and the cover on a regular basis and be sure that they're emptying it so uh, you know excellent excellent job uh, Pachara and Pachara students and th you know thank you so much for uh, for being willing to allow me to tape you and uh, ask questions and I see that there is a question from Marilyn Quo who I know is in uh, is in Maryland she wondered about how long did it take for you to complete this research project and Pachara you can you can talk or you can uh, type it in we did research. We conduct the uh, mosquito larvae around two months uh, in Park Main Beach. Did you hear uh, me? Yep, we hear you. That fantastic. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. So it took you know only about two months worth of you know collecting the data, and yeah. uh, as, as you see, uh, her students are so 
you know, so amazing in their ability to be able to, to present the work that they did. And if anyone else has more questions to ask Pachara, um, please feel free to go ahead and enter them in the chat window. I put up the link for um, accessing her information. I also, um, in the blog that I'll be posting in a couple of minutes, I'll post the link to that. You will be able to see um, some other, uh, the, the, the video that her students made as well as their poster. So wonderful work and Pachara again, thank you. The scientist whom you've been working with there in, in uh, Trang and also your students. Ah, um, did they share, there's another question. Um, Elis wants to know, did they share the results with the hotels? And, and what did the hotels think about this? Uh, during the uh, collect the data in the second month, we uh, try to sharing uh, uh, the breeding site of the multiple with the hotel and the very surprise that uh, first time we don't know where is the main breeding site of the multiple in their hotel and they and we suggest the way to uh, to protect the multiple in their hotel uh, they can change the decoration or change the type of the the breeding site that maybe the will be the main of the uh, the multiple building thank you very much that really is a very you know an interesting question and and i would imagine that you know these places that that who, whose industry relies on tourism would, you know, only find it very useful if you're helping to point out the, you know, potential places in which mosquitoes might be laying their eggs and, and also when you found actual larva, what a help as well. And a great way to involve your local community, your students as well. Well, we're going to be finishing up uh, by hearing from um, Jeff Bauman's students in Shum at, at Shoemate Middle School in Gibraltar, Michigan. We're gonna start off by seeing a video of his students responding to some questions I had asked them about their research. And then Jeff is gonna show, um, he's gonna share his screen and he's gonna be showing uh, a little bit. So, so Cassie will wanna make him one of our panelists. He'll be showing a little bit of information uh, about the, the poster that his students had um, on the research that they did. And then he's gonna be telling us how he integrated uh, something that he has called the weather stem, which he got through a grant uh, through Wileses, um, which is a, a globe focused grant. And he'll be sharing how his students were able to pull this data in, uh, a couple of best practices that he has explaining to us phase one and phase two of this work that they're doing. And um, then I'll jump back in and we'll finish things up. So if we can go ahead and show the video of Jeff Bauman's students the other day. Cute as the Dickens, these are middle school students. Before you did this investigation, were you aware that just little places that had standing water could be a perfect mosquito breeding habitat? Um, kind of. Yeah, we I didn't really know that. Like they could, they have to lay their eggs where it's moist. So I was thinking, well, they're more active in the summer and it's like really hot and dry, so I couldn't really relate those, but yeah. I was really shocked when I found out they could just be in little ponds or even the little puddle that's like in my front yard. That's just crazy to me. You know, I, that, that's kind of how I felt as well. I, I started looking around my, my yard and my you know, garden more often. And I have this cute little statue. It's like a girl holding a, a skirt up. And water collects in it. And now I make sure that I, I check it every single week, you know, now that it's active mosquito season. Because um, I don't want to have any more mosquitoes than, than I'm, not, I'm not trying you know, per on purpose to be uh, raising mosquitoes. <laughs> Well, then I had another question. Um, has any any of your like like I don't know kind of everyday behavior changed now that you know how easy it is for mosquitoes to lay their eggs just anywhere? Like, has that changed some of what you what you do or what you're looking for? I, my behavior, I think, um, anytime I go anywhere by water or anything or 
like if it's raining out and it's like summertime, then I think I'm going to wear more like mosquito repellent. Yeah. So I can make sure I won't get any mosquito bites. Yeah, because every time like I'm near water, I'm like thinking in my head, that's probably a place that mosquitoes are. Uh, that's a place that mosquitoes are probably are. And um, I live by pond, so I'm more aware now that I should wear mosquito repellent like in the summertime so I don't get that many mosquito bites. Good, good. Now, you know, nice to hear. And then I'm, I hope also you think about making sure that the water is, is fresh, you know, that that's, that's sitting outside if it's out for, you know, animals or in a bird bath that once a week you're changing it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, cool. Very, very good. And, and then is there any advice that you would offer to other students who are thinking of using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper in their science projects for next school year? Um, no. The first one is take the mosquito measurements daily because they can one day can affect your whole um, your whole project because you could find out which areas mosquitoes are more often to be uh, off of those measurements. Another one would be like take it more by land because whenever we get come a little closer. So. I would take it more by land because if you take it more by land, usually it will help um, you find more because sometimes we'll like go on like a little pathway that's a little farther into the pond and we we'll usually never get mosquitoes. But when we're by like the land, we always will get mosquitoes. That's really, really, really neat advice. And I guess that takes practice, doesn't it? Like you say, getting out there and doing it regularly. I will say you so rock. Talk about getting science done. Your team has made the Mosquito Habitat Mapper honor roll many, many times. I believe I just sent you a certificate congratulating your team for uh, over 10 times uh, making the honor roll, which means that you're submitting a lot of data. So, uh, so good job. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you making a little time, and maybe we'll see some of you on Wednesday night just kind of hanging out on the webinar. But, uh, again, just, just really appreciate your work and loved working with you this year, and I look forward to thank working you. with you next year. Thank, thank you so much. You. You're welcome. Bye. I've so enjoyed working with them and uh, just absolutely love working with Jeff. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Jeff, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit of how he's always getting science done. Thank you very much, and uh, greetings, everyone, from the University of Michigan, Dearborn. Uh, my college class just finished up for the night, and uh, now I get to share out all of the awesome mosquito stuff that we are um, doing at Tumate Middle School. Um, just to get going uh, real fast here, Dorian, you asked me to um, share... Um, our students poster and essentially uh, Mohammed, Sophia, Bailey, and Olivia, uh, their project thus far is a two-stage um, series for their Mission Mosquito project. Uh, phase one involved them uh, trying to identify the um, certain components or parameters of active mosquito season. So uh, Dorian worked really close with these four and um, it, this year was all about finding the data. What are the environmental conditions during this period? And so um, as, as Dorian said earlier in the webinar, we are blessed at Shoemate Middle School in Gibraltar to have a weather stem weather station. I know I, I talk about this a lot, but it's, it's awesome. It's, it's one of the coolest tools that we have for science in our, our community. And so uh, the picture right here, that is our weather stem station. And to help them with their project, um, Bailey, Olivia, Sophia, and Mohammed um, used our weather stem station that's been logging data for over two and a half years to find out the active mosquito or the, the parameters during active mosquito seasoning. So they did a lot of data mining um, to come up with their data for this project. Um, weather stem is an automated weather station that submits to the GLOBE program daily. And um, it, it also informs our community what the weather the weather's like at Shoemate and the Carlson campus, and it helps us make you know informed decisions um, as a community. So it's a really really cool thing. Um, right here in the the bottom of the poster, you'll see uh, the four individuals working with uh, Dorian during the our IVSS project, and um, they truly love working with Dorian and talking mosquitoes and, and 
holding the webinars. And I got to be flat out honest with you, a lot of the other Globe students that we had during advisory were very jealous of all the cool stuff that they got to do with you, Dorian. So hats off to you. That was very, very cool. So um, right here, this is a look at some of the, uh, the graphs that the group was able to make using weather stem. Uh, they looked at humidity, precipitation, and temperature. And um, they looked at active, the active mosquito period for the last two years. So um, automatically having this weather station, they got a foot up on their, their work because all of this data had been stored sitting in weather stem and it was just waiting for them to, to go and data mine that out. So um, again, it's really cool. Um, in the chat, I dropped the URL to our weather stem station. And tonight I'm just gonna give you a quick um, how to define more data for active mosquito season. So if, if you want to have a phase one where students identify the um, humidity, precipitation, and temperature values associated with a season, um, we, we have, I believe there are over three, 400 weather stem stations across the country, the United States of America. And it's very easy to get your hands on this data. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you have weather stem or not, um, you can get this, this data simply by using a data mining feature. So uh, once again, the URL is on the side there, and I'm going to switch over to the weather stem station. Um, can you see this, Dorian? Will you nod, please, if you see it? Weather stem? Um, I don't see weather stem yet. Right now, I'm still seeing the, uh, the slide about the research the kids did. Okay, I'm going to switch over and right there. Does that work? We got it, dude. You're all good. All right, cool. Um, so the, the website is uh, wayne.weatherstem.com slash Gibraltar, and this is our live feed of what the weather's like right now at uh, the Shoemate Carlson campus. It's 72 degrees. Uh, beautiful evening by the looks of it. And one of the coolest things about WeatherStem is the data mining feature that not a whole lot of people know about. So if you are a citizen scientist and you want to find out the conditions associated with active mosquito season, all you got to do is find one uh, weather stem station. Personally, I don't know why you would use another one other than mine, but if you had to, so be it. But wayne.weatherstem.com slash Gibraltar is the coolest. Shameful plug, whatever. Um, but here we go. When you get to our, our site, you can see all the, the current temperatures and things like that. But when you go to this data option right here, it will bring you to data mining. And so I'm going to click on data mining right here. And I'm going to take in just a quick second. And so this page will show up. It says weather stem data mining. And this is what um, my four rock stars used to get all of their data was this, this fantastic data mining page. And to do it, uh, all you have to do is select the county. And so for me, I'm using Wayne County, Michigan, where Shoemate Middle School is. And then you pick the school district. Um, you can add comparison stations. So if I wanted to compare um, Shoemate Middle School to Penn State University, I could do that as well. Um, all you got to do is just click on it and then you can switch um, whatever county, whatever state you want, and then you can keep digging and find, find the school that you want. Uh, as soon as you have it, you can uh, take a look at their website, go back and forth until you, you get what you want. So if you're in Florida, I'm going to tell you something. You have an amazing resource at your hand because you have so many weather stem stations in Florida, you have your pick. I mean, I believe there's one in every county, which is super cool. So for Mohammed, Bailey, Sophia, and Olivia, what they did was they went to data mining and all they had to do was uh, select the parameters that they wanted to look at. So they looked at uh, rain gauge and they looked at thermometer and I believe they looked at humidity, which was right here, our hygrometer. And so after they selected those three sensors off the station, uh, they went down right here to select their time period. And uh, let's say for instance, they wanted to use uh, April 15th through today. All they have to do is uh, hit apply. You can change the times if you want. So if you wanna set it to uh, midnight, you can do that. But just for the sake of time here, I'm just gonna apply this. So now those parameters have been applied. Um, and now the next thing that you have to select um, is your output. And so right here, a CSV file is much like um, an Excel sheet. So they use the uh, CSV file to kick out their data. Um, sometimes you can use, it will make a data table for you if you'd like. It can create custom charts if you'd like to see those. 
Um, and so right here, we're gonna go um, the CSV file by the day. And let's say they wanna find the, the maximum uh, temperature for the day. And then all they have to do is hit submit. And then right here, as soon as it's ready, all you have to do is download. And then you have your CSV file um, waiting to go. And I'm gonna have to switch my screen in just a second here because that went to CSV, my apologies. Um, sorry about that. We have gotta jump over here now. So I have my CSV file right here with all of the parameters that the students wanna look at and, and mine. And what, do, what, as Dr. Tony Murphy would say, what is the data story here? What do these numbers say? And what, what do they tell you? And so once the students get this, uh, they can go in, start looking at it, start making graphs, fine tune their data tables, you name it. Um, if you are working at a school that's one-to-one -one using Google Classroom um, or Google Apps, uh, what we wound up doing is we took the CSV file, we uploaded it into, a, um, into Google Drive, and then we converted it to a Google spreadsheet, shared access to all four group members, and then all four of them could man manipulate and work with the data right from their Chromebooks in, a, in our one-to-one -one classroom. And um, it was seamless, it worked really well, and that's how they came up with all their graphs and, and charts and data tables and things like that. So um, it's a really easy um, way to get data. And I, I gotta be honest with you, it's, the data mining feature is it's fantastic, I love it. And um, our students are just, they're, they're going crazy with it. As a middle school teacher teaching weather, um, I will actually have them data mine and find you know, weekly, um, what was the, the, the highest wind speed over the last week, you know, and, and I have all of my students do this, but my citizen scientists can dig so deep using this awesome feature. So, um, and that's, that's how they put it together. And then the rest was, was on them. So after they got their data, um, they started, you know, putting it all together. What does it mean? And now they're moving into phase two with Dorian and they're looking at mosquito counts and they've got mosquito traps out. And um, right now we have been using pond water, but after listening to our friends tonight, we might have to switch it up to fish food because we, have, we haven't really found uh, any mosquito larvae just yet. Uh, it's been very cold in Michigan. Lake Michigan last weekend was about 46 degrees. I jumped in, it's cold. Um, so I think mosquito time is, it's, it's coming up here. Um, and, and over the summer, these four are gonna continue taken measurements and then they're going to use that in next year's International Virtual Science Symposium project. So there you go, Dorian. That's all I got for you tonight. Dude, as always, you're getting science done. Hey, would you do a favor and uh, somebody asked, what is the website link of the weather stem? They couldn't read it. If you'd put that in the, uh, in the chat window. And um, wow, Jeff, thank you so much. Really cool and what an amazing use of technology and of, of you know, data mining as well. So uh, thank you so much. And Cassie, if I could have the next slide. Um, we're just about finished up here. I hope that everybody's gotten some, some kind of neat ideas for moving ahead. Uh, for the honor roll, what I do is I take a look at, for the last four weeks, since this is a kind of a monthly thing when I'm doing this webinar, who are some of the people who have consistently ended up at the very top of collecting and submitting their data. So you, you can see here that we've got so many different countries that are represented. And what I'm super stoked about is we've got Inez here, we've got Jeff here, and we have Pachara here. So our three rock stars who presented tonight are also our rock stars when it comes to collecting and sharing data. In August and also in November, we're gonna do a, a kind of a special thing with um, the education webinar where we're gonna be going around the world. And so we'll be hearing from some of the people in these different countries and telling us a little bit about where they're, you know, a little bit of information about their country, about the mosquitoes that are found and the mosquito transmitted diseases in their region, a little bit of information about um, the groups that they're working with. So we're, we're kind of gonna do some armchair travel so that we get a chance to take advantage of this absolutely rich global community that we have who are all bugged literally and figuratively by uh, mosquitoes and mosquito transmitted disease. Next slide, please. And upcoming events. Um, 
Our next newsletter, actually, we're, we're putting it off for a week because we're a little bit early in the month of June and we want to add some more, uh, some more stuff to it. So actually look for our next newsletter on June 19th. Also on June 19th will be the next Citizen Science webinar. And talking about, you know, data uh, mining, this is actually going to be on data reporting mapping tools. So again, a wonderful way to access and use technology to be able to help you with better understanding the environmental parameters uh, associated with the life cycle of mosquitoes. In, uh, in, in um, July, I'm actually going to be doing the education webinar on a Tuesday. It will be uh, at 2 p.m., kind of switching up the times here. I will be having Dr. Ben Zajcek coming on and talking about some of the research he's doing in um, Peru using uh, NASA Earth observations for helping him better understand malaria. And I'll be giving um, kind of a brief introduction to how you can go on and use some of our mapping tools, uh, Worldview, and um, pro probably we'll just focus on using Worldview to take some NASA environmental parameters like temperature, humidity, and precipitation and layer those to help know when to um, predict, expect, monitor uh, vector, you know, mosquito transmitted disease. And then on July 24th, we will have our citizen science webinar and be looking at how can uh, mosquito citizen science data protect communities from disease. So all of you are part of, you know, a, a super, super important undertaking, trying to reduce the threat of the world's most dangerous animal. And we really thank you for making, taking some time with us. A huge thanks to Inez, Pachara, and Jeff and their students for spending time with us today and uh, and doing some presentations and thanks Cassie if you'll click through this there's a couple of ways you can get involved be sure you get on our newsletter and webinar mailing list visit and share our globe mission mosquito website check out our archived and upcoming webinars and be sure to try out the app and submit your data so we will stay on for a little while. Yeah, thank you, Maisie, about Centara. I have been in touch with them, and um, we'll go and, and, and visit them. They are a local group that is, uh, is working on a vaccine for malaria. They're actually uh, using this vaccine experimentally in three countries in Africa. And I'll be going and getting a little bit of information from them and uh, visiting their labs and you know, trying to understand some of the ways in which we're using uh, a technology to help us to come up with some, you know, solutions and some, some potential solutions to these problems. So thank you. Thank you so much.